This week, we talk about two different approaches to street photography and how to leverage composition in both. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Candid Frame. A couple of weeks ago, I got a message or a comment left on one of the videos, one I was doing about this whole idea of composition in which you set up the scene, uh, you look at light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture, and you kind of evaluate it for all of those things, find your composition and wait for something to complete the shot, like someone walking in the frame. And someone made the comment that they thought that that wasn't a really a practical approach to street photography because they imagined that most great street photography is really about seeing and witnessing a spontaneous moment and then raising your camera and just getting the shot. And that is sort of a, a, a valid approach to street photography. But if you look at our Flickr pool or you look at any street photography on Instagram or anywhere else, you'll, you'll realize that that kind of moment is pretty rare. Uh, we're always on the hunt for that, but um, it's really hard to find and to capture well. And I think that whether you're shooting that way or you're shooting in the way that I suggested in the other video in terms of finding your scene first, that paying attention to elements beyond your subject is critically important. One of the reasons I photograph the way I do in which I sort of establish the scene first is that it allows me to hone my skill to be uh, hold my skill with respect to composition. And by composition, I don't mean just the placement of various elements in the frame. What I'm really talking about is awareness of all the things that make up a shot in the frame and making a conscious decision to either include it or exclude it. Some people limit their understanding of composition to the rule of thirds. And that's the extent of it. They just you know, imagine the rule of thirds, they'll place their subject there, and they think that that's the end-all and be-all of a good composition. But for me, I've learned over my many years as, as a street photographer, is that awareness is really the key. And making clear, informed, practical decisions of not only your subject's existence within the frame, but the other elements are really essential to making a really good shot. And I've chosen three shots um, I don't really understand or know what the circumstances were for each photograph, but I think it will allow me to discuss some of the ideas that I've just uh, brought up here. So let's take a look at a few of these images and see what we can make of it. Okay, here we have a shot by Greg um, Bakeloff. This was created with a Ricoh GR2 at 1 25th of a second, F8, ISO 3200. Now, this shot by Greg is sort of the kind of shot that uh, I suspect that the commenter made, where you come upon a really interesting scene, this boy catching rain with his open mouth, and uh, that this is great street photography, and and it's a wonderful shot. It's something that everyone who's you know been a child in the rain has done, you know, catching those droplets of water in in your mouth and uh, with your eyes closed. It's something I really really relate to, and it's a great great genuine moment. But it's not the moment alone that makes this an effective shot. There are a lot of things at play here. Um, there's obviously light and shadow that's here. There's line and shape. There's no color, but there is certainly gesture. So this image possesses many of those visual qualities that make for a really interesting, interesting shot. And while most people would come upon a scene and just make a, a photograph of this and probably pull off an effective shot, it's more than just luck that, that makes this shot interesting. One of the critical things for me is the position of the boy relative to the street itself. And if you pay attention to um, the the tone of the street itself, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, the light and of the sun, which is being diffused by the clouds, is coming from the right. So his upturned face is illuminated by light, as is the front of his shirt, and the area behind him, his back, the back, back of his head, are relegated to shadow. So the light is coming from here. But that's not exactly the only thing I want you to pay attention to. The other thing is, look at the street itself. This area here is relegated to to shadow. It's a little darker. And this area right behind him is a little brighter because we're catching the re reflection of the sun on the wet street. And this creates a point of contrast because now, because this dark area of the street is perfectly outlined here, 
this bright air in this, uh, of, of, of his face and his shirt create this wonderful contrast. As well, it's happening here behind his head. This dark area behind his head here, or of his head, is contrasted in this area of brightness here, helping to define pretty much his whole body within, within the frame. And for me, that is a critical component of making this shot work. There are a lot of photographs of really interesting moments, uh, very much like this, but the problem that often ruins these shots is the stuff that's in the background. There's some distracting element that either reduces the, the ability to cleanly read the subject or is just contrasty. Had this car, for example, been right behind this boy, uh, it would have been a big distraction. You know, this would have bled into the car and it would have ruined it. And, he, and the photographer was lucky that this driver was making a right-hand turn rather than getting into this area of the frame because God knows how, how long this lasted. But look at the placement of this boy, especially between these, these, these two cars. That, for me, is really important. Now, this shot may have only, this moment may have only lasted for a couple of, a couple of seconds. But for me, there are still critical choices that need to be made. Because if the photographer had been, say, positioned a little more to the left, for example, the boy here would have been completely silhouetted by the shadow. Not silhouetted, but basically outlined by the shadow. We wouldn't have this separation here. And for me, even when I only have seconds in order to react, I'm always assessing not just the moment, not just the gesture, but everything else that's in the frame. And... Frequently, I'm making these micro adjustments where I shift to the left, to the right, move up or move down or move closer or move further back because I'm considering the subject in relationship to everything else that's in the frame. Now, we're really lucky that there weren't that many cars in the, in the frame. Uh, the person on the far left, even though he's wearing a white t-shirt, uh, isn't a distraction. We don't have a bunch of other people here cluttering the sidewalk. Uh, and the curb here to serve as a distraction. This boy is virtually in isolation. And so the line of his body, his face, his gesture is perfectly complemented by the other elements in the, in the scene without being distracting. The repeating pattern of the facade of the building, of the 7-Eleven, of the street sign, even the, uh, the line of the curb, all of that contribute to providing us a sort of a sense of, of place, which plays off this, this child, because you can see how we keep going to that kid. The white or silver car in the background is a little bit distracting. I probably would have burned that in just a little more, because right now the hood of this car is the brightest element of the frame. But, you know, you can't have everything when something is happening this spontaneously. So, you know, sometimes you have to rely on post. I wouldn't excise that uh, car completely from the frame. I don't believe in that. But the only other thing that I think is could have made the shot better is if you look at the bottom of the frame uh, the right foot is cut off and if you're paying attention to everything else in the scene not just the subject what what i would have done is backed off a little more to include both his feet in the frame and that would have just taken maybe a second or two and if you anytime you're making a shot if you navigate around the periphery of the frame you can identify problems like that. So I recommend going from 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and then refining your frame and then making a, making the shot. I do that all the time, even when I'm responding within seconds uh, to make the shot. I quickly navigate the area of the frame. And oftentimes it saved me from ruining a shot that, or diminishing a shot that otherwise I think would be really, really good. But this is a great shot here. Um, great moment. Now, we have a shot by John Crum. This was made with Olympus uh, EM1 Mark II at 1 400th of a second, 6.3, F6.3, ISO 64. Now, we have this woman wearing this orange garb walking away from the photographer, and I obviously see the attraction here, that that saturated orange or reddish color really is an eye, eye popper. And what makes the shot interesting for me is not just that red garb, it's how it relates to everything else in the frame. One of the things that uh, I think the photographer uh, did here, which was a good choice, was to photograph this woman just before she transitions from light to shadow. For me, that transition between light and shadow is something that I try to leverage all the time because contrast, whether it's 
you know, white and black light or, or white and black light and dark is a real visual draw. It really pulls our eye into the scene. So by positioning the woman there between that transition between light and dark and using the color, it controls the viewer's experience of the, of, of, of the photograph. It's basically telling, telling the viewer, I want you to look here first. So you have that light and dark, that transition between light and shadow. You have the saturated color. And because of where that subject is positioned, the, basically the shape of her, from her head down to the bottom of her garment, creates this wonderful triangle of, of, of color. And show, you can see the, also the folds of the garment as well. And you can get these nice little points of contrast, of texture as a result of that. Now, if the photographer had waited a couple of beats until this woman was completely into shadow, the whole shot would fall apart. Because then you would lose that saturated orange color. That color would become much more muted as a result of being in, in shade. The shape would have less, less impact. And you, you, and you would also lose the shadow of her, her shadow on the ground, which mirrors the shadow of the car to the far right. You can see how the other cars in the background, there's even a person walking on the far left, they're barely dis discernible, right? Because the light levels are reduced. They don't possess those, those saturated colors. Shapes are more kind of bleeding into each other. Other than the repeating patterns of the windows in the background, shape is pretty negligible here, other than maybe the shape of the uh, pickup truck in on the right-hand side of the frame. And then you also have a woman there in black, uh, who's sandwiched between the sedan and the truck. But sh you can barely see here. You can see why the red and the, or the orange on the, in the middle of the frame is so important to the shot because both of those women are illuminated by the same light. But the red and that orange makes, makes the shot. It's the anchor over which everything evolves, revolves. But again, I don't know how much time the photographer had they may have seen this woman walking and anticipated that I want to get her just as she's transitioning into, into that area of shadow, which is a really good move. He could have probably photographed her when she was much closer to the camera and was more prominent in the frame, but I think her placement here is really, really good. And I like the slight tilt of her head to the right because the way it sort of creates this drape and this flow of, of the garment is really just a really nice shot. But you can see how... If you're seeing, even when you're seeing someone walking like this away from you toward the spot where you anticipate you want them to be for the shot, you have the time to make a lot of decisions in terms of what you include in the frame. And uh, I think that this shot um, is really served by all those different elements in the background, even though they're in shadow. I think the repetition of the windows and the facade of the building really work um, really well. The the truck is a little brighter. Uh, than anything else, especially at the top. But for me, that's not a huge distraction. I think one of the things that helps here is because the car reads as blue. Uh, it may be a silver, I suspect it's probably a silver car, not a white one, or it may be a bluish, uh, bluish color, that it contrasts really well with the saturated color of her clothing. That the bluish tone that pervades most of the shot uh, plays off of her just just perfectly. Had that truck been red itself, I don't know whether or not I mean, it wouldn't have worked. It would have completely allowed the shot to sort of fall apart because at that point, um, it, it, our eyes would be competing uh, between the red car and her her garment. But you know, regardless of you know what that truck's color should have been, you can see how her position within the frame is really, and its effectiveness within the frame, is so related by the other things that the photographer chose to have within the composition. And uh, if you're not paying attention to that degree and you're leaving stuff to chance, it's almost inevitable that you're going to find stuff later when it's too late to fix uh, that will actually ruin the shot. It's a really simple shot. It may not, may, may not have the drama of the pre previous frame, but the photographer does leverage everything that he has here in order to make a really effective photograph. Now, if you want to submit images to the Candor Frame Flickr poll, it's free. You don't have to do anything. 
All you really have to do is go to Flickr, go to the candid frame. I'll display the URL uh, right here. And all you ha have to do is ask to be added to the group. But you'll have to do it on your computer. If you try to do it on your tablet or phone, you'll get a notification that uh, it's a private group and it's by invitation only. That's not the case. That only happens if you try to access the account through um, your phone or your tablet. You have to go to your computer, and I usually get to it once a week, and then after that, I'll be glad to, to add you to the group so you can contribute images, and, uh, and I'll possibly use it in the video, but more importantly, it will allow you to see what other Candor Frame listeners are, are producing and sharing uh, here in this community. Our last image is by Byron Seagraves. This is created with the Leica Q at 1 2,000th of a second, F11 ISO. 400. Now this is Hollywood Boulevard uh, out here in Los Angeles, California. It's a location that I have photographed uh, countless, countless times. So I'm very familiar with how difficult it is to photograph here. It's, it's really demanding because it's always such a busy street. There are countless tourists and residents moving up and down the street. It is a constant sea of people, which makes for making a clean uh, photograph very, very difficult uh, because you may have an interesting subject, but because you have so many people in the background, so many cars moving up and down the street, buses with tourists stopping at the curb, there's just so much visual noise in the background. Trying to make a really clean shot is incredibly difficult. Now, this shot was made in the late, late afternoon, and there are two ways that this shot could have been made. One is simply just walking down the street, raising the camera and making the shot which is possible. Uh, the other one, which is like, is, is the way that I practice more, is that I will basically find a spot and wait for subjects to come close to me, and then I'll raise the camera in order to make, make the shot. Now, I, I use the, the latter technique largely because it gives me a little control over, over the overall composition. And one of the things that I do, especially during this time of day, is I will find a location where light is illuminating the street because in the late afternoon because of the buildings that are on the south side of the street to uh, the right of this of this scene there'll be uh, sh uh, areas of shadow and there'll be areas of sunlight and i want to leverage the sunlight in order to make the shot so as the sun is going lower and lower uh, in in the sky i will go to areas where the light is is illuminating the facade of the building and the people as they move through because I know I want that contrast between light and dark and what it can do to colors and tones and textures. And so by choosing my position rather than being in shadow, I'm increasing the likelihood that I'll be able to make a very interesting shot. And by waiting for people to come to me and me having the camera, there's less concern about having a photographer with a camera uh, one, just because there's so many people there already taking pictures, but two, they everyone assumes that you're just taking photographs of something else. Because what ha will happen is I will look down the street and I'll see who's coming, and I'll choose someone like this woman with this with this you know silver wig and these sunglasses and these red lips, just just great. And so what I'll do is I'll just position myself, and as they come closer to me, then I'll raise the camera, or I may take a few steps forward just to bridge the distance between me and them to make to make the shot. You can see that Byron here is pretty close to the subject, um, probably less than three, three or four feet. And, uh, and that's why one of the reasons I believe that he probably practiced the technique that I just described, because uh, when you're walking towards someone, to make uh, to make the shot, it's a little more it's a little more difficult because there you have to sort of gauge their pace relative to yours, and then you have to be that much more aware about all the other elements in the frame. Uh, I may be wrong, and he, Byron can obviously leave a comment below to to let me know which technique he approached. But that's what I kind of think happened here because that's the way I personally I have found uh, I get a greater percentage of shots by working working this way. So you get the woman with the with, with the hair and the sunglasses and the red lips. She's great, but you also have other figures here. And to Byron's advantage, we have this woman here on the left-hand side who has the hat up to her face, which may be positioned there not because she's trying not to be photographed, but maybe because of the position of the sun. Because you can see this fellow on the right 
who is blocking the sun with his hand. So I suspect that it's more about um, blocking the sun so that the glare isn't hitting their, their eyes, more so than her being aware of the phot photographer. You know, it's 50-50. It could be either way. But the gesture provided by her and the guy on the right really are a great way to sandwich this woman here um, with the sunglasses and the wig and the lips. And I think you probably see either the, the, yeah, you see the shadow of the photographer here on this woman and also on the woman on the left. So the low sun is actually pretty low on the horizon. So I suspect that it's the sun itself that they're, uh, they're blocking in both, uh, with both of these people here rather than uh, uh, concerns about the photographer. But by having those two people there, you can see that they complement each other in terms of gesture, and they sandwich the, the key anchor of the shot, which is the woman at the center of the frame. Now, you, you don't see a lot of the people in the background. They're blocked because of the position in this woman in the frame. And that was a big consideration in terms of the composition because she's so close to the camera, she dominates, dominates more areas of the frame. And also the photographer is positioned on the far left of the street, right next to the theater. So basically half the frame is occupied by the theater and the store on the left rather than the sea of people that exist there. So I don't know how conscious Byron was of that, but that for me is a big consideration anytime I'm shooting here is like, how do I eliminate all all the people that are in the background who are really just distractions and my choice to where I position myself, how I use the light and shadow that's present and how close I photograph to my subject are all considerations, not just for my subject, but for all the elements in the frame. So then, then that's basically composition, me choosing what to include and what to exclude. And when it's, and when it's the choice to exclude, how do I get rid of stuff? because I'm not gonna Photoshop stuff out while I'm shooting. So the only thing that I can do is my position relative to everything else in the frame. Getting for, you know, getting closer, pulling further back, moving the camera down, moving to the left, to the right, whatever I need to do in order to make the shot work. So composition isn't about just, you know, the rule of thirds. It's about being aware of your subject, everything else in the background, and making decisions in terms of how you use all those elements, how you leverage those elements to emphasize what you think is the most important element of your shot. In which, in which case, it's this woman here, and these two figures on the left and the right just sort of add to the overall spontaneity of, of the shot. And uh, having photographed here countless times, I know how diffi difficult it is to pull off a good shot, and I think Byron here uh, did it incredibly, incredibly well. So I hope you found that helpful. I love feedback. Uh, it often inspires me to uh, think of new ideas to talk about on this on this channel. It doesn't seem like I've exhausted uh, even a tenth of what's out there. And I hope that you're enjoying these. But if you want to listen to The Candid Frame, The Candid Frame is a podcast in which I interview photographers about their work and career. And they're not just street photographers. Some of them are fashion photographers. Some are landscape, wedding photographers, just everything. And if you want to listen to the show, uh, you can go to thecandidframe.com and you'll see our archive of now 466 interviews. Uh, we're on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, any any uh, place that you listen to podcasts, you'll find it. You even find it here on our on our YouTube channel. But uh, if you want to check out uh, everything that we do, you can just go to thecandidframe.com and uh, check out my work as well as the workshops that I'm offering, several of which are going to be coming up soon uh, at the end of this month. I'll be in Washington, D.C. for the Focus on the Story uh, Photo Festival. In June, I'll be, I'll be teaching my two-day photography workshop in uh, Hollywood. And in December, I'll be teaching a workshop in Japan. And to find out more about all those things, just go to thecandidframe.com, go to workshops and classes here in the menu bar, and uh, click on any of those links, and it'll take you there. So thanks again for joining me. I hope you like what you see here. And if you do, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.